Good morning again. If you have your Bible, open with me to Philippians chapter 1 as we continue our series in Christ. And I'm, uh, I'm going to see along with you and we will see together uh, why in Christ is such an important title for the book of Philippians. Because as we go along, uh, we will see deeper and deeper and further and further about how everything we do in life as a believer in Jesus is because of Christ in us. Anything that is good in us is because Christ is in us. And you see that the Apostle Paul makes it plain for us to understand that in all of his doings, in all of his missionary journeys, in all of his preaching, in all of his way of life, of, of leading and guiding these churches, especially for us with the church of Philippi, it is because in Christ, it is because Paul had Christ. And he's saying the same Christ that Paul had of the first century is the same Christ and the same spirit that you and I have to live today. And he brings up this point because it is the spirit of God that is in you. It is the fact that Christ is in you that would make this next subject even possible, the subject of faithful partnership. When you think about partnership, many things come to mind. I know that uh, for partnership in our own home, it requires a faithful partnership for four children to get up in the morning, to have lunches packed, and for them to get on, uh, to school on time. Uh, it is definitely weighted in the direction of my wife, I don't think I would be called a faithful partner in that, but uh, my wife takes up the slack. But uh, many of us, when we think about faithful partnership, we think about uh, maybe a business partner, someone that you do business with, and that would be someone that is faithful, somebody that is trustworthy. Uh, maybe you're thinking about the faithfulness of how a team interacts and works together. That would be faithful partnership, but there's something more when we are uh, prescribing this to the church. And Paul says there is much more in our understanding of what does it mean for you and I to be in faithful partnership together. Because what we see from the Apostle Paul in this passage, Philippians 1, 3 through 8, we're going to see four things that are required of us to be in faithful partnership that will build God's church. You see, faithful partnership is something more to Paul. Partnership is necessary and is expected in order to build up the church of God and the kingdom of God. And so if you have your copy of God's word, would you stand with me if you're willing and able? We're going to read these verses together, verses 3 through 8. In verse 3 it says this, it says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. God, would you take your word and would you speak to us clearly today? Uh, Father, that your spirit would uh, guide us in our understanding of truth, uh, that you would illuminate things to, to bring it out so that our finite minds could understand the infinite things of God. And so, Father, would you take us, take our lives today, would you mold us into the likeness of your son, Jesus? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may sit down again. 
You can see the way that Paul is talking about this church in Philippi and how he is centering it on this idea of the reason why he is able to write to uh, the church in Philippi uh, these years later is because of faithful partnership. And he starts for our understanding that faithful partnership builds gratitude. You can see it from the very beginning um, from Paul. In fact, it's throughout this passage, it's throughout the letter that you can see this, this clarity and thanksgiving from Paul's words. Like you can see a heart of gratitude because of Paul's words and the way that he writes about the Philippians and the way that he writes about the brothers and sisters of this church. And he says, I thank God for you. In every remembrance of you, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. And then he says, always praying with joy for all of you in my heart, in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, some of us may be thinking about the start of this church at Philippi right there at Neapolis, at the, uh, at the, where the seaport is, just north of there, and be reminded of all that Paul went through, and then us, it would be fair to assume, well, maybe Paul just has a little amnesia. Maybe he doesn't quite remember everything, but look at what he says. Look at the way that he describes this uh, so that we cannot mistake it, right, for amnesia. He says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance, always praying for all of you. There is absolutely no way that you and I can mistake this to think, well, he's not talking about everything. He's not talking about everyone in the church. No, he's talking about everything and everyone that is a part of this church family. Those who would say, I belong to the First Baptist Church of Philippi. Paul is writing, that's a joke, by the way, it wasn't called that, but uh, Paul is writing to them to say, I give thanks to my God for every single time I think of you. For every moment that comes to my mind of our past, I thank God for these things. Paul, did you forget what happened at the beginning? Did you forget that you were kicked out of city after city? Do you forget on that second missionary journey, uh, the time that you go to Philippi, of the fact that you were thrown into jail? Do you remember that you were beaten? Do you remember the sufferings? Do you remember the trials and everything that you went through? Do you remember those things? And Paul would say, absolutely, I remember every single one of those. And I give thanks to my God for every remembrance. That's fascinating, right? And a little bit challenging to us. It should be challenging to us. Because we live in a society that struggles with gratitude. I don't know about you, but we struggle with gratitude in our home. Mama cooks dinner. No one else contributed. And we're quick to say, not me, I would never, but my kids are quick to say, I don't like this. I don't like that. We just struggle with gratitude, right? It's just natural within us, and it's actually natural for every single one of us to live a life of complaining and grumbling. That's actually what is natural. That is actually what is cultural and what is normative. But what Paul is describing here is a counter-cultural life, something that is not normal, something that is against the grain. It is called a life of gratitude. A life of gratitude that has nothing to do with your financial wellness, your health, your circumstance, whether you're in jail or not. It has nothing to do with those things, with how things are going. Gratitude has everything to do with who Christ is. See, it's easy for us to to get off in one direction and be frustrated about life. I get that. 
I understand. Maybe some of you today, you're going through a season where you are just thinking to yourself, you expect me to live a life of gratitude? You have no idea what I've gone through this week. You're right, I don't. You expect me to have a life of gratitude for cancer, for sickness, for the brokenness in my family? You want me to have gratitude for these things? You want me to thank God? Hey, God, thank you so much for my cancer. Thank you so much for making me sick. That's not what Paul is talking about in, this, in, in terms of generality, but rather what he is talking about is coming to a place in your life and a faith that is so secure in Christ himself that he says that whatever you face, you can say, praise be to God because I am forever ever secure with him. And our gratitude is as sure as the fact that Jesus is on the throne. Anytime that Jesus is not King of Kings and Lord of Lords, then you have permission to no longer have gratitude. But until then, which by the way will never happen, we are called to live a life of gratitude. Did you know that gratitude has this way of building up those around you? In fact, there is study after study after study that for sports teams or uh, business organizations or whatever, uh, th there are studies from Harvard and all these other places that are no longer trustworthy, but they're still out there, all right? But they talk about gratitude in the workplace and gratitude on teams. The fact that you can weather storms and you are more likely to weather the storms of life if someone, not everybody, but if just somebody has a life of gratitude. And soon that one somebody and their life of gratitude, it starts spreading like wildfire. And it goes and goes and goes and it starts building and building and building. And all of a sudden, your organization, your business, the church, your life, your family, your sports team, whatever you are on, listen, all of a sudden, you have this wave of gratitude. You have this wave and a momentum of gratitude that starts spilling out into every single person. And this is what Paul was reminded of. I mean, just think about this. Paul's not just reminded of the bad things. He is overwhelmed at the goodness of God. He's thinking about Lydia, the fact that she gave her life to Jesus and was helpful in the way that she helped start that church, that she was generous. And because of her generosity, they built that church in Philippi. He's remembering the jailer and how he was so far from God, didn't know God. He gives his life to Jesus and his entire family is transformed. He would be talking and thinking about the slave girl that was demon possessed in Acts chapter 16 that gave her life to Jesus and was radically transformed. You see, what Paul was fixated on was the fact that life change was happening around him and the fact that people were being saved, lives were being transformed and there, were, there was a movement in Philippi for the people to understand who Jesus is. And this is why Paul had so much gratitude because he was watching what Jesus was doing in their lives, not complaining about what God was not doing. He wasn't complaining about what the church was not doing. He was not complaining about what the world was doing against the church. Instead, he was saying, look at what God is doing. And church, this is where you and I have to stay as faithful partners together. To look around our church and to thank God, why would you use us? Why would you use us week after week and day after day and year after year? Why would you use us? There is no reason that God should use us. And yet he does. And let me tell you, church, it is absolutely abnormal to see baptisms week after week after week after week, to see life change week after week after week. It is not normal. God is doing something through you. In fact, just over the past five weeks, we have CR that meets every Monday night, Celebrate Recovery, 
every Monday night. In the past five weeks, 54 people have given their life to Jesus just down there on Monday nights. I mean, this is incredible to, for us to think about that God is doing something special. This is why he says, I pray with you with joy because God is on the move. He says, have joy, always praying with joy. Joy is not something that that we just, it is an emotion. Joy is not a circumstance. It's much like gratitude. Joy is an attitude of the heart. It's something that we must choose together. It is a command. This is why Paul tells us and commands us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus commands us to have joy. In Philippians 3.1, he says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice command in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice. Again, he says in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again as if he wasn't clear enough the first time. Rejoice. There are no parameters or circumstances that can produce joy in your life. But we see that gratitude and joy are intimately intertwined with one another. Gratitude is setting your mind on who God is and what he has done rather than who the church is not and what they have yet to do. This is where we have to be cautious. Isaiah 12, 2 says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. This is what Isaiah 12, 2 tells us, that God is our salvation. So there will never be a time that we do not have a reason to be grateful and live a life of gratitude. Complaining in any circumstance in your life, complaining at home, complaining at work, Complaining by yourself in your car, all right, complaining at church, complaining on the ball field, complaining at school, wherever you are at in your season of life, complaining will always quench joy, whereas gratitude will always produce it. We must be careful that as faithful partners in faithful partnership together in order to build up the church that we commit ourselves to a life of gratitude. And what this will do is in turn will build confidence in your own life. Faithful partnership builds confidence. Look at what he says in verse 6. He says, I am sure of this. That he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I am really thinking that this might happen. I, I really hope that this will happen in your life. We can't be sure. No, that is absolutely not what the apostle Paul says. He says, I am sure of this. I am 100% certain. There's actually no way that this will fail. It is not blind optimism, nor is it a blind hope, but rather it is the security and the surety that we have in Christ Jesus himself, that you and I can walk with a confidence in life, not an arrogance in life, but a confidence in life, knowing that you belong to Jesus Christ. You see, this is the confidence that you and I will have. Do you remember in your own life, do you remember the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus? In your own life, just think about that day in your own life. Do you remember the day that you were transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ? You can point back and say, that is the day that I gave my life to Jesus. That is the day that I was saved. And Paul says, if you have that day, if you are truly saved, then I am sure of this, that he who started that work, because you did not do the work, it was Jesus Christ that did the work on your behalf. And so I am sure of this, that he who started this good work in you, this good work of salvation, he is going to see it through. 
There are no chances that Jesus is not going to carry you through life. This is why we can have gratitude. It's because we have the confidence that Jesus Christ is carrying and sustaining his people. We just learned about this in the book of Hebrews, that that not only is Jesus Christ the creator of all things, but he is the sustainer of all things by the power of his word. And what Paul is saying here is, is that Jesus is going to carry it on, your salvation on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's not until it ends, it's until Jesus. Jesus returns. He is going to make sure that you make it. Isn't that a great confidence? That whatever you face in life, you can have gratitude because you know for a fact, you know with certainty that Jesus is going to carry you. He's going to carry you through the loss. He's going to carry you through cancer. He's going to carry you through the sickness. He's going to carry you through a wayward child. He's going to carry you through a brokenness and divorce. He's going to carry you uh, between all the, uh, the relationships that we have in life that are broken over and over again. He's going to carry you through uncertainty, through tragedy, through challenges. He's going to carry you through it all, and he's going to make sure that the enemy will never be able to snatch you out of his hand. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Praise God, you couldn't do anything to save yourself because if you could save yourself, it would be left up to you to sustain yourself and to sustain your own salvation. Praise God, thank you, Jesus. It is not up to me to keep myself saved. Instead, he said, it's God's gift, a free gift that you don't deserve, that you can't earn. It's not from works so that no one can boast. You can't walk around with arrogance. You can't boast about the fact that God elected and saved you and justified you. It had nothing to do with you. And then he goes on, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Jesus is going to carry out his plan. He's going to carry out his plan for your life. He's going to sustain you through all of it. He says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. He says, for those he, being Jesus, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That means until the day you meet Jesus face to face, Jesus is going to see your life through. There's no scheme of man. There's no plan of the enemy. There's no plan of Satan. There's no attack from from the Democrats or the Republicans. There's no bad president. There's no bad anything that can take you away and out of the plan of God. You are saved. You are secure. And here's what is so great about the salvation of Jesus Christ. You see, when God saves you, He saves you entirely and eternally. It is not partial, nor is it progressive, but rather it is permanent for your life. The moment you give your life to Jesus, you are saved. You are being saved. You are being sustained, not because of you, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Anytime you think, okay, well, I'm out of it. I'm out of the race. I can't do this anymore. God has forgotten me. It is obviously that the Lord doesn't care about me or love me anymore. And and let me just tell you, those seasons happen in life. And it's not because you are evil. It's not because... You've just lost your mind. It's because we face real life. And Jesus knows that. 
And he was so gracious to give us Romans 8. He was so gracious to give us verse 6 of Philippians 1 to remind us no matter how hard and bad it gets, Jesus is going to carry you through it all. He gives you that confidence. And this leads us to be able to participate with no hesitation. You see, faithful partnership builds participation. You see, there would be no way for us to participate in the things of God, especially when things got difficult. Let's say persecution was on the rise as it was at the time of the writing of this letter. I mean, AD 64 is a bad deal. AD 70, bad deal. All of it is just on the rise of, uh, of Christian persecution, trying to remove those who follow the way. And they were scared to participate in the things of God. They were scared to participate in the church and the activities of the people of God. And Paul is writing them to remind them, no, listen, faithful partnership, it actually builds particip participation. It doesn't build a life that is cowering away from the things of God, but rather it gives you the broad shoulders that you can face the world knowing that you have the backing of Jesus Christ that gives you all the confidence to do everything that God is calling you to do. Everything that God says for us to participate in, discipleship, reaching the nations, all of these things that is very clear in God's word. He gives us the confidence to be able to participate in those things. And it's all based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, this is what it says in verse 7. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you. All again, all of you, because I have you in my heart and you're all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Paul is very clear here that the expectation is that everyone would partner together in the church. You see, faithful partnership is orienting your life around a shared vision. That's what faithful partnership is. Faithful partnership is denying ourselves for the benefit of the shared vision that we have together as a church. This is the way it was from first century. There's a reason why we have what we call Vision Sunday every single year. And we talk about it all the time because faithful partners are orienting their lives around this shared vision, which is the same vision that Paul had, that Lydia had, that the Philippian jailer had, that the slave girl who was demon possessed, that those brothers brothers and sisters of the first century, they all had this one shared vision, and that was transformation for people who do not know Jesus. It is transforming lives with the truth of Jesus Christ. That is why it is so important for us to understand that when you become a member of our church, it is not just a letter of recognition. It is just not like a badge that you get. Instead, what you're saying is when I become a member of this church body, I'm entering into the same membership as the church of Philippi, as the church in Galatia, as the church of Ephesus, and all the brothers and sisters who have gone before us and who will come after us, that we were entering into a life that would be denied of our own flesh and our own desires, our own wants, and even if those are good things, I deny these things in my life so that I may orient my life around the shared vision that God has called us to as a church family that is no different from the same calling the brothers and sisters had in first century. When the Spirit of God lit the flame of the church and the Spirit fell on the people of God, there was a clear empowerment to do what God called them to do. In Acts 1-8, he said that you're going to go right here, you're going to be my witnesses here and to the ends of the earth. Matthew chapter 28 says that you're going to make disciples of all nations. You're going to baptize, you're going to teach, you're going to make disciples. This is what you are called to do. We are called to transform lives with the truth of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. See that the new has come. This is the idea that Paul had for the vision of the church, for the vision of individuals, for us to understand that when you come to Christ, the old is gone. You no longer orient your life around the things that you want. You don't orient your life around what is most comfortable for you or what is best for you. You orient your life around the gospel of Jesus Christ and his mission. And for far too long in America, listen, this is what has happened, that we have been become okay. And guess what? Me too. We have become okay with a life that is oriented around what I think is best. And I promise you this, the Spirit of God is constantly trying to root this out of my own heart because it is deceitful. It will win you over real quick to do what you think is best for you and your family to do what you think is best for your own life, for your job, for your career. But this is not the calling of God on our lives. Instead, it is I am called to orient my life to serve you in the kingdom of God. All of us are called to that same direction. But what Paul promises is that not only will faithful partnership build, build this Will it build participation? But as you participate, you know what happens? Faithful partnership builds affection. Do you hear the words of Paul and the way that he's talking about that church and the way that it is obvious that he loves them? Other times Paul said, I, I'm just a drink offering being poured out for you. Listen, church, I want that to be said of my life. I want to stand before Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I just wanted to be a drink offering poured out for you. You ring me out. You take my life. You do whatever you want. If you want me to preach here, I'll do it. If you want me to preach in Africa, I'll do it. If you want me to preach and, and no longer preach whatever God wants, I want to orient my life around the truth of Jesus Christ and his plan. And, and this church family is what we are all called to do whatever Jesus wants of my life, whatever Jesus wants of my finances. I want to orient my life to produce the greatest impact for the gospel and for the kingdom of God. And as you do that, the affection for the church is going to grow and well up within you. You are going to long to be with the people of God. You're going to have a desire to be with the people of God. And this is where he gets because he uses it twice. He uses this word partnership twice. He says partnership, then partner. Same Greek word, koinonia. And when we think about koinonia, all you Southern Baptists out there, you think about fellowship. That's, you, that's what it was translated mostly in the English language, was fellowship. The problem is that when you and I think about fellowship, I immediately want to run down to Popeye's and get some fried chicken, and I want to hang out with my brothers and sisters, right? There's something more of what Paul intended of this word. In order for us to understand the full effect of koinonia, what it means to have this loving fellowship, which have this loving partnership. What it means is that I have such an affection for you in the kingdom of God that I would rather Deny myself so that you may flourish. That is affection. I would rather die on your behalf so that you could know Jesus and your family know Jesus. This is affection. This is what Paul is talking about. This is the language that he is using. He says, I have all affection. I have you in my heart. He's saying deep inside, I long to be with you. I desire to be with you. Why? Because he loves them with the love of Jesus Christ. And this is what we see from Paul over and over again, is that if you have a growing love of Christ, you will have a growing love for the bride of Christ, his church. 
that you will have a growing desire to be with the people of God. But not just to hang out, but to continue to expand the kingdom of God. You see, our gathering is only as good as our willingness to go out from here. There was a a theologian and British Navy chaplain, his name was Broughton Knox, but he found himself as a chaplain with the British Navy on uh, D-Day. They were all heading toward uh, Normandy and they're a part of storming the beaches. And Broughton Knox, he looks back as their chaplain, he looks back over and he says, there is such a strange peace among these men. He says, there's something strange about the love that you can see that they have for their brother on their right and on their left. And then they, they, they go, they, they know exactly what is expected of them. They know exactly what they are doing. And here's what Knox says as they get off, they return back and he sees something different. He knows this. He's, he tells uh, in his book, he says, everybody had a shared affection for one another because they had a shared vision of what they were training for, what they were gathering for, what they understood about the mission, what they understood about the gospel, the lives that were at stake, the freedom that was at stake, and they knew their mission. Therefore, they had a peace about gathering with their brothers and storming the beaches of Normandy. And brothers and sisters, listen, you and I have that same expectation on our lives today, that we would have an affection for one another because we have a deep affection for the things of God, for the mission of God, and we may not be storming the beaches of Normandy, but by golly, we are storming the beaches of of hell with every everything that we have because the enemy is on the move and the church is expected to move against that enemy so that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth. And it's up to us to lock arms together in faithful partnership, not only with us, but with Jesus Christ himself going forth in the mission of God. The question for you is, how can I be a part and be a faithful partner? The first thing you have to do is give your life to Jesus. There is no one who can be a partner in our church without the Spirit of God in them first. Second, you need to join our church family. You need to lock arm in arm with these brothers and sisters who are heading with a shared vision and a shared direction for the purpose of Jesus Christ. Third, maybe you need to just serve somewhere. Orient your life in that way. Maybe you need to give to the church. Orient your life in that way. Whatever that is, you know what God is calling you to. You've heard the word of the Lord, and it's our time to respond in obedience. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you our lives. We give you this day. Father, we want to make an impact for your glory. So God, would you help us do that? Would you help us understand what it means to be a faithful partner in your church for your kingdom? God, that goes beyond Green Acres. It goes beyond our connect group. It goes beyond our family. It goes beyond a generation. Father, this goes all the way back to the first century, the very beginning of the church, that now we are carrying the torch And so, Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be in faithful partnership with you, fueled by your spirit, and walk with the confidence of your salvation. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.